thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, today I want to talk about, as the title says, about the, the evolution of the, the open source data processing space. And because I am from Data Artisans, I also want to give you a bit of the flink view of this evolution of data processing. Before we start, so that you can put this in the context, I uh, have been working at this company, Data Artisans, since the beginning, since we founded it. We are the, the original creators of Apache Flink, and we created this company so that we can develop Apache Flink into open source and also work with companies and develop products based on Apache Flink that make Flink easily usable by, by those companies. These are some of the the companies that are using Flink, so some of the big names are Alibaba, this is a very big Flink user and also a contributor. Uh, Uber is uh, quite interesting. Interestingly, there's also Lyft on there and some, some Spanish companies as well. And working with these companies, we have been part of the evolution of data processing and we also know what the future developments of, of that space uh, could be or what they should be or what they what they mean for the development of Apache Flink. So that's also what I kind of want to talk about today. Also, I will talk about different systems and I might represent what these systems do or I might uh, give you the wrong date for when they are created. So this is not because I'm malicious or because I mean to them. It's just that sometimes uh, people make mistakes. But you can come and talk after me, uh, to me afterwards and correct me if you want. So the main the main question or the threat through this presentation is how can we process data uh, and what are the systems available to us for processing data? And I think the need for processing data is obvious. We have all these sensors and information from users and information from all these systems that we're using and we somehow need to process that data and sometimes somehow need to make sense of it so that we can make decisions uh, in the company or wherever we are working. And this need has been there basically since people had some kind of access to data. So at the very beginning, so since basically that's what computers were invented for, um, for data processing, initially we had to write our own custom programs for processing data. So initially you would write you would put a program into a punch card, then you would maybe write assembly code, then you had more purpose-built programming languages, you had Fortran, then you had C, then you had Java. And since the beginning of computing, basically people wrote programs uh, that are purpose-built for a specific data processing task. But uh, software engineers like to think that this is kind of hard and that they are a bit special, and programming is actually is kind of hard, and this makes data analysis uh, or means that it is not available to uh, a somewhat larger circle of people. So, for example, there's data scientists or there's business people that, that could express a need for data processing. So, for example, they could say, I want to know the average churn rate of users, or I want to know how many users uh, in a given day or in maybe in a season they leave my my telephone service, so they can express this, but uh, it's hard to actually write a program. For this, you need software engineers that can then write this program in these special purpose languages. And that's why I think the, the, inv invitation or the in invention of databases, which was uh, around, happened around in the 1970s, we can argue that, but that's when people worked on these relational databases at IBM, uh, IBM where these databases came up and where SQL came up, that for the first time um, this made data processing available to a larger audience, if you will. Because then you can express a SQL query that reads somewhat like English, so even if you don't know SQL, you can look at a SQL query and roughly understand what is going on. And this allows more people to get access to data processing. You don't, know, you don't longer need the programmers to write these special case programs to, to analyze this data. And then, because we had SQL, which is somewhat standardized across the, the database industry, at least nowadays is, in the beginning it wasn't like this, but there are also tools that generate SQL 
and that make using data processing technology very accessible to a wider range of people. And then um, I will get back to this in a while, but an important thing is that um, these databases, they also enabled a new type of applications where you have application services that are running somewhere and they can communicate to each other and they can put data in a database. And this allows these business type applications where you have, for example, a business event like a customer signs up and then this uh, kicks off some computation and puts data somewhere and this sends a message to another service and this again does a thing. So I will go back to this later. But this is, uh, this is, uh, basically the prehistory before the advent of big data. So we are at a conference called Big Data Spain. So obviously we are somewhat interested in that. So big data uh, arguably was started when Google released uh, this MapReduce paper where they described this, this programming model, this very simple model, MapReduce, where you basically write a map function and a reduce function. And then the framework can take these functions and parallelize computation uh, across a massive amount of parallel machines. So this, before we had MapReduce, people, of course, they, they could write parallel programs that used multiple computers. They had, there were supercomputers. You could use MPI and other things to write parallel programs. But MapReduce made it available to a wider audience and had provided this framework idea. idea. And then with uh, Apache Hadoop, which was uh, an open source implementation of this MapReduce idea that started at Yahoo. This also became available to uh, yet again a wider audience because this MapReduce thing that Google published it was it's basically the internal system, but no one could use it. Apache Hadoop now is a system in the open source that people can use. And there's big companies that sprung up around uh, Hadoop, so there's Cloudera, there was or is Hortonworks, depending on how far they are in their in the process. But the thing is, um, or what is, what is the defining idea when you use these, uh, these, these MapReduce type systems or uh, Hadoop is that you store your data in some distributed file system. So for Hadoop, this is HFS, for example. You store all the data, all the data that's coming in. And then at some later point, you can go to that data lake and you can start asking it questions. So keep that in mind that this was um, the model that we were working with at that time. And we, this is kind of history repeating itself. So we have had these custom-made programs, then we had SQL, then we had MapReduce and this big data stuff. And it was, again, a bit hard to program this because you, again, had to write custom programs to use this. You couldn't use SQL. But then, of course, systems came up uh, around this, so there's Apache Hive and PIC, which provide, so Hive provides SQL for writing uh, queries that are executed via Apache Hadoop or some other execution systems for now, so there's test and get more things, you can run Hive queries via Spark and so on. And there's PIC, which is another querying language for this. So here we again repeat this history that we have a system that allows us to process data, but is somewhat limited to a uh, cast of special use case people. But then SQL makes this, again, available to a wider audience, but this time on this MapReduce model on Apache Hadoop. And you can use the same BI tools and whatnot to do this. And then somewhere in there also Apache Spark came up. Uh, I'm sure Matei Sadia can tell you a lot more about this, but Spark was a bit of a revolution because it uh, made this quite a bit faster. So Apache Hadoop, which MapReduce was a bit limited, but Apache Spark took this idea of parallelizing things to a bit of a next level, and there you could then again do SQL and all these kind of things. So this was basically um, the way of doing things is what we nowadays, or back then also called the, the batch processing way of doing things. So you would, remember, you put your data into your storage system. And then at some point, you can schedule a computation. For example, say, calculate the average churn rate over this last month of data that I have stored. And then you get the result for that. Or for example, um, if you want to detect credit card fraud, you maybe have your, 
your week or your day of data, and then at night you run uh, a SQL query or some MapReduce job on that data, and then this gives you the some results of where there might be credit card fraud, and then you can go there and kind of sort out this fraud and see what you can do. But it's in this batch mode, it is you have your data sitting there, and then you start a query that calculates something and then finishes it. And the next step uh, in the evolution was basically this, um, this rise of the stream processing systems. And uh, again, there were research systems and other systems before that, but the, the first popular system that took this stream processing approach was Apache Storm. This was for writing programs that are running basically 24-7. So you, have your, you write your program using the Storm APIs, and then you have a program sitting somewhere, and it's producing data as, it coming, as it's coming in, in real time, and it produces results in real time. So you would get immediately a notification that there is some credit card fraud, or you immediately get a notification that there's some customer at risk of uh, leaving your company or not being a customer anymore. And um, before Kafka, people were using different message queues and all kinds of systems, but Apache Kafka is in the stream processing space an important development that came out of LinkedIn, and it is initially it was just a system for storing a stream of messages. So like HDFS is a distributed file system for storing data. Apache Kafka is a system for storing streams of data. It's basically a buffer from the sources of the data that you put the data in, and then you immediately consume it with systems like Storm, for example. This, the, the advent of Kafka made this a lot more popular in technologies. And quite nowadays, every company that does stream processing arguably also uses Kafka. Um, a bit of a detour was this thing called the Lambda architecture, um, where people, they, they were not comfortable or they didn't believe that these stream processing systems like Storm were reliable enough. So you had your MapReduce, your Hadoop. This was a reliable system that had fault tolerance and would produce correct results when you run it on this daily data. And Storm um, could have failures, so it could maybe forget messages. And it has there's these different um, semantical guarantees where you have exactly ones or at least ones where you say maybe you process your data Maybe you process it, maybe you don't process it, you don't know. Do you make sure that you process all the events exactly once and so on? So people were skeptical, and then they used this Lambda architecture, where you have a stream processing system like Storm to give you real-time insights, but then every night or every weekend or whenever, you still use your batch processing system and process the data, and then this produces the, the results that you actually use. But the stream processing results, you don't... You don't use them for longer term. You just have immediate insights and then you throw them away, but the real results, or the ground truth, is still based on the batch processing systems. But this uh, changed, uh, arguably, around maybe 2015, um, when Apache Flink became a very prominent stream processing system. So Flink, um, I will talk later a bit about what Flink is and what it does, but Flink managed because it had these strong guarantees, it had this exactly once fault tolerance for stream processing and for state, it managed to convince people that you can trust a stream processing system, so you don't need this Lambda architecture anymore where you have two systems, you have your batch system and your stream system, and you kind of manage both of them, and you write the business logic for the MapReduce system and for the streaming system, and you kind of manage both of these. But Flink managed to convince people that you don't need to do this anymore, because now we had reliable stream processing. And um, I had this earlier slide where I said the, the batch uh, mindset is you store all your data, and then you can ask questions later. So you store your credit card data, and later you can ask, was there maybe some fraud in there? So the big thing that stream processing, reliable stream processing enabled is that you can put the questions first, and then you can see if something happens. So for, for example, for this fraud use case, you, you develop a program, you put it in place, it is running 24-7, and then in real time, it gets all the events, and in real time, it can give you a warning when there is a credit card fraud, and it can prevent that fraud from actually happening. So this was, in my opinion, one of the bigger shifts, because it allowed 
real-time insights into what things are happening in a company, in a factory, in all those kinds of things. And of course, you, you probably are expecting this, so um, these stream processing systems, again, it was kind of hard to develop programs, but then um, at some point we also had SQL for stream processing systems. So there is um, Flink SQL, there is Spark Structured Streaming, which has a SQL-like or SQL for stream processing. And yet again, we have this repeating history that SQL makes this stream processing available for a wider audience of people. And there's multiple players in this. So there's uh, Flink SQL, there's KSQL by uh, Confluent. There's multiple people in that space. So now, um, at the end, now that we have all this understanding of where things came from and why, how things developed, I also quickly want to talk about Flink and then how Flink potentially will develop in the future. So we have this, um, the way I think about this, the processing landscape is that you have offline processing where you have your data sitting there and you can run queries on it and you have real-time uh, processing, so for example, hard real time would be like those high frequency trading people that have machines sitting in the basement of the stock exchange. So that's kind of the spectrum that we have. And on the left, we have traditional batch processing. So this is more offline for these streaming analytics and continuous processing use cases where you just want to monitor data or continually, continuously want to gather some metrics and perform some aggregations and get some results. This is kind of in the middle of the spectrum because using a stream processing system for this is very good, but you can also use a batch processing system where you, for example, schedule a batch processing job every 10 minutes on your data, so you get somewhat real-time results still. But the, on the far right, these event-driven applications that I mentioned quickly earlier where you have some business events that trigger some other thing and then maybe you want to set a time out for if such and such doesn't happen, then I want to do this in the future. For these event-driven applications, you really need a stream processing system such as Flink. So, talking about Flink, what, what are the things that, that you have in a, in a stream processing system or in a, in a processing framework in general? So the, in my opinion, you have three parts. You have the engine, which is the, the thing that makes sure that you can execute programs, that manages the different machines. So if you have clusters of several machines, the engine is what makes sure that the communication between those machines works and that, for example, you have a good network shuffle between those machines and um, for running those stream programs. There is the APIs that you use to express those stream programming jobs or those batch jobs. So there's MapReduce was, the API was just you had a map function and reduce function. Nowadays we have these more expressive APIs that Flink and Spark have where you can uh, put together multiple calls of like map and flat map and reduce and join and window and so on. And SQL is of course also an API that you use to specify something that you want to do, a query that you want to run. And then the engine takes that and executes it. And then the third part is connectors, because if you, have, if you have this bigger system that is super good, and you have nice APIs for writing these programs, but you can't really get data from the outside world, so you can't read your files in S3, or you can't read from Kafka, or Kinesis, or PubSub, or all these other systems, and if you can't write data to those systems, so you want to maybe publish your results to some InfluxDB or some Elasticsearch, then it's pretty useless to have that system. So that's the, the third biggest or the part in a stream processing system. So for Flink, the, the engine is basically um, how you run things. So deployment is if you, for example, you can run Flink on just, if you have 10 machines there, you can run it on those 10 machines, call this bare metal. Or if you have a cluster management framework like Yarn, which is part of Hadoop, you can use this to deploy uh, Flink worker nodes, we call them task managers, on those machines, and then they sit there and they can accept queries. Or there's, for example, other systems like Mesos or Kubernetes, which is becoming uh, very popular these days for um, running those, those worker nodes. And the, 
The important building blocks that the Flink engine provides is basically that you have a very fast network shuffle because for processing these streams of data in real time, you need to send them across different machines. Maybe you need to partition them by some key or some partitioning function, maybe. And the, the most important building block is that you have uh, state and timers. So if you have, uh, for example, a or you need to, for example, monitor some temperatures from a sensor, you need to compute the average, and then that thing that you, that you keep on those machines is what we call state. So for example, you have a running count of something, or you have a running sum, or, and then you can compute the average, or for example, if you have uh, these event-driven applications and some event comes in, you need to store in that state that this event comes in, and then at a future time, when another event comes in, we need to see what events have I already seen? And this is why we need state in these machines. And the other thing are timers, uh, which basically are a way of scheduling computation in the future. For example, there might be an event that comes in that says, uh, customer opened uh, or started to shop on my shopping portal. And then I set a timer for maybe two hours in the future that says, um, in the timer, then I can see if that shopping session was successful or not, and then I can react based on the events that I have in state. I can then compute some insight into maybe why that shopping ses session was not successful. So this, this very important building block, state and timers. And if you have state and timers, so you have, say, your 10 machines sitting in your cluster somewhere, they all have state and timers on them, then the system needs to provide guarantees that this state is not lost when uh, accidents happen, so when these machines fail or when there's some programming error and these machines go down, you don't want to lose that data, so the system needs to provide fault tolerance. And then here um, you have again these semantical guarantees that I mentioned. You can have uh, at most once processing, so you process an event at most once, which is kind of shitty because you might lose events. You have uh, at least once where you say, I pr process each event at least once, but potentially more, and then there's this exactly once where the system makes sure that it looks to the outside world as if each event was processed exactly once, even in the case of failure. So when failures happen, Flink, for example, can restore from uh, some backup of that state and then continue processing, and it will look like that failure didn't happen. The next, uh, the, the second component of a system is the API, so Flink has um, this data set API, this is for, for batch processing. It has the data stream API for stream processing. It has what we call the table API, which is a relational kind of API that is, uh, also contains the SQL API. And this is just because of Flink evolved with, uh, along with this, the space um, that we are in. So initially, there was the data set API because people did batch processing. That was Flink had. Then at some point, uh, we went into stream processing, so Flink added this stream processing API. And then at some point, we added the table API with SQL because we need to make that technology avail available to a wider audience. And there's a couple of more specialized APIs for graph processing, for machine learning, for complex event processing, but it's uh, details. So the batch API is quite straightforward. Everyone that has worked with Spark would understand that immediately. Uh, the data stream API looks very similar to that. And here, you basically can do stateful stream processing. You have access to the state and timers that I managed to really do these low-level things like this event-driven application. And there's also higher-level APIs for windowing, which allows you to say, for example, I want to compute the average temperature sensor, uh, the average sensor temperature every hour or every day or maybe even every hour, but trailing by 10 minutes or something like this. And an important characteristic of the data stream API is that if you want to, you can have complete control over what it does. So it's quite a physical API. So what you program is what you get, basically. It's different from SQL, where there is typically an optimizer in between that takes the query and maybe orders some, some joins around and tries to be clever about it. But the data stream API is what we call a very physical API. Uh, the table API of SQL is uh, an API that allows you to write NC compliant SQL queries that can be executed um, on batch data or on streaming data with the same SQL query. And 
One important thing is that, this, that you don't, there's no programming required, so you don't need to write Java code to use this. You can just um, define some data sources and data things and then uh, put in a SQL query and then it does something. So it could be for running on historic data or it could be for putting in some fraud detection thing if you can write that as a SQL query and then it is running 24-7 and produces results. And the important thing uh, in the SQL API is that it has this pluggable framework for connectors in data formats. So someone, for example, there's connectors for, for Kafka and S3 and file systems and you can read file formats like JSON and Avro and you can mix, mix and match those and people can plug in their own connectors or data formats if they need to. Uh, this is from a blog post that I recently wrote just so that you get a feel for what this SQL API looks like. So here I'm starting a Docker Compose based setup that you can also uh, check out if you go to the Data Artisans blog. So here I'm just starting uh, these, the Flink SQL client. Then I'm looking at what are the data sources that I have to find. So I'm looking at some tables. So there's some taxi rides. So this is from like a ride service like Uber. I look at what the schema of the data is. And then I can just say select star from text rights, made a little typo. Uh, and then we just get results. So this would then be a query that is executed on a Flink cluster and produces results in real time without me needing to write any uh, Java code. I just define my data sources, my data sinks, and I define my query, and then Flink does the rest. And as I said, the third component is connectors. So Flink, of course, has the usual, usual suspects of connectors, so you can connect to Kafka, you can read from Kafka, write to Kafka, there's Kinesis, uh, there's Elasticsearch, Cassandra, there's someone in the process of contributing a PubSub connector, um, and as I mentioned, the Table API has this modular library of connectors and formats that you can mix and match. So this is just an example, so don't be afraid. I think this is an example from this, from this um, blog post that I mentioned, where we define a, a data source. And we, this is three parts, basically. On the left, you can see we define the fields that uh, we have in this data. In the middle, we say that we actually want to connect to Kafka, so we say what the version is, and we say, uh, how to connect to Kafka, so what the, the zookeeper and the, where the Kafka brokers are. And on the right, we say what the, the format of the data is. So we say this is, some, this is JSON data, and that is a specification of what the JSON data looks like. And then Flink can just read from that Kafka connector this JSON data. So going back to this, this stream processing landscape, this is how currently Flink covers this landscape. So you have the, the data set API for batch processing, you have the data stream API for uh, these streaming analytics use cases, this continuous processing, and for these event-driven applications, and you have the table API, which is um, a unified API, so you can write your program once, your query once, and then Flink takes this and compiles it to either a data stream program or a data set program, based on whether you have streaming sources in there or whether you have batch sources in there. So that's how Flink covers this landscape, but uh, what is a potential next step in the evolution of Flink? So this is being discussed, so this is, uh, because Flink is an open source project, I can't really say when or if, when this will happen basically, but there's a lot of discussion in Flink and by the people at Data Artisans where most of the committers work, what, uh, and there's some consensus on what the next step will be. So for this we have to look again at um, how the data set and the data stream API, what the difference is. So the difference is mostly that if you know you have batch data and you know that you can read all that data and then do and then sort it or maybe do some other things with it, you can use optimized algorithms. For example, if you know how joins work in a database, if you know that your data is finite, you can use a hash join algorithm, for example, where you first read uh, the it's one side of the join, read all the data in, build a hash table, and then you read the other side of the join and join it with the, this hash table that you have built up. In streaming, you can't really do this because your streams are unbounded, so you don't know when the data is finished. So in streaming, you have to use different algorithms for it. And these algorithms, they are 
it's kind of historically grown that we have these two different sets of APIs, but it's nowadays it's not really necessary anymore. And one problem with this that some customers are feeling now that this is a problem is that you can't easily combine uh, historic data sources and real-time data sources. So for example, you might have your historical data stored in some S3 or HFS, where you have the historical data for maybe the last year of what happened, and then you have your, your real-time data, your events coming in, you have them in Kafka, but you can't write a program that reads from both of them, or maybe does the clever thing what you would expect it to do. So ideally, what you could do is write a SQL query, and then Flink goes first and reads from that historic data, and then when the data is read, it switches over f to reading from this uh, real-time data, and it's not really visible to the user that this is going on. And so the, the next bigger step in the evolution of Flink, uh, and this is actually quite a big change in the runtime that will require maybe the whole year to develop, but the big thing that we want to do is to unify batch and stream processing, so that you don't have this difference between the different APIs anymore, so that you can just seamlessly read from historic data, from real-time data, have your queries that work on this data, and that you can seamlessly integrate these historical sources and the real-time sources that come in. And there's actually uh, a bit earlier this year, uh, Xiao Wei from Alibaba, he gave a keynote at the Flink Forward, it's a conference about Flink in Berlin, uh, about how Alibaba uses Flink internally, and they have this crazy scale, they have tens, ten thousands of nodes that they run this on. It's quite interesting, actually, but what they are also working towards is this unification of batch and stream processing, because they have a lot of experience running Flink in production at a very large scale. So the community, which includes data artisans and Alibaba, is trying to get this grand unification of Flink happening. Because then, if we extend this table API a bit and make it uh, do a bit more than SQL, and we still have SQL, we can use this table API that seamlessly works for the batch and stream processing use cases, and the data stream API would then be the API if you really need access to the low-level details of what's going on, like the state and timers, and you have, if you have these event-driven applications. So, that's really, it's a huge step, in my opinion, this unification of batch and streaming, if we can pull it off. So I'm quite excited about this. But if you are interested, you can check out uh, flink.apache.org. Uh, if you want, you can check out dataartisans.com slash blog. There you can find this, this article that has this demo that I mentioned in there. So you can, if you have Docker on your machine, you can just go there, Docker Compose up, and then you can start playing around with, these, with this Flink SQL thing. And uh, that's basically my company again. We're hiring if you're interested. But thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. I Maybe I have time for some questions, but I think I will also be outside to answer questions. I don't know how. OK, if you have any pressing questions, you can ask them now, or I'll be outside. Hello. Um, how, how do you manage changes on schema, data schema? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a very good question. This is one of the most tricky questions. And um, the answer is that if you, if you write a streaming program using the data stream API, and maybe you have your state in there, or maybe the data that you ingest changes, then you can, we have this thing called in Flink called state evolution or scheme evolution where you can change the the shape or the schema of the state. But if you use SQL, then we currently don't have a solution, a good solution for that. Because um, the problem with these long running streaming applications that run 24-7 that have some state, some aggregation that they are working on, and then if you change your SQL query, the optimizer might reorder the joins or, or come up with a completely different physical plan for that, then it's very difficult to 
migrate that schema over to that nuclear. So we are, that's a thing that we are very aware of and will hopefully find some solution for, but currently for SQL there's no good solution for that. I'll be outside if anyone wants to find me.